So what do we have to do? Look for a monster? <laughs> you don't have to go very far. I think that they make them to order right in the studio. Good evening, guys and ghouls, and welcome back to Monster Craze Memoirs, a generational podcast about B-movies. I am your host, Ian Garcia. With their unique combination of puerile chills and teen-centered plot lines, the films of producer Herman Cohen, I Was a Teenage Werewolf, Invasion of the Saucer Men, I Was a Teenage Frankenstein, and Blood of Dracula, they swept the fledgling American international pictures from Poverty Row upstarts to titans of the independent film circuit. Never once to spare a stone when there was blood to be squeezed out of it, AIP waited on Cohen's next concept, which came to the producer as he was clocking out late one night from the offices on the nearly pitch-black Ziv Company production lot. Many night I would leave the studio late, and at that time you didn't have good security like we do now. Now we have so many guards they bump into each other, but at that time studios used to be very dark at night. A light here, a light there, and I thought to myself, Gee, what a great spot to do a horror film. Cohen and frequent collaborator Aben Candle immediately set to work on drafting a script that would repeat the formula of their previous pictures, centering on a crazy old-timer who manipulates, dominates, and controls angst-ridden youths for his own megalomaniacal purposes. In an inspired twist, though, How to Make a Monster would take place on a movie studio lot during the production of a crossover of Teenage Frankenstein and Teenage Werewolf and feature as its villain a resident makeup artist who uses a combination of numbing foundation cream and hypnotism to deploy the film's monsters as assassins. Taking revenge on the new studio bureaucrats intent on forcing him out of the job as they cease production on monster movies. From the silent magic shows of Georges Méliès and Segundo de Chamon to Universal's iconic openings to Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, a certain degree of self-awareness and black comedy has never been far from the purview of film horror. Indeed, I would argue that far from a direct continuation of gothic literary tradition, horror cinema, particularly in an American context, has always more often than not been weighted with a degree of self-aware removal and comic farce. Indeed, as it rose to economic prominence, especially evident in Invasion of the Saucer Men and Teenage Frankenstein, American International Pictures had virtually taken on the horror spoof as its own self-aware brand. In a New York Times profile on the studio published on March 16, 1958, studio executive James H. Nicholson made his self-awareness abundantly clear to readers. At a time when anxieties over juvenile delinquency were renewing moral crusades against commercial cinema, particularly what were seen as the lurid output of horror and sci-fi exploitation makers, Nicholson defended his company's output on the basis that America's youth understood far more astutely than their parents that films like Teenage Frankenstein were the stuff of unbelievability and caricature. Irrepressible young people didn't go to these types of movies to shrink in terror or thrill at spectacular sadism. 
they came to heckle the ridiculous monsters, the bad production values, and the scene-chewing performances. But even by the self-aware standards of the genre, how to make a monster far less a black comedy than a rather stuffy melodramatic thriller is a significant effort despite its myriad flaws. Decades before Cabin in the Woods, Scream, and the explosion of self-aware horror in the 1980s, when the ambivalence of post-modernity had thoroughly displaced gothic seriousness from the genre, how to make a monster is possibly one of the earliest examples of the truly self-referential horror movie, not merely courting the audience's awareness of the intrinsic farce of the horror subject, but rather going further to stoke their nostalgic appreciation of it, especially as a subculture of cinematic fandom representing a critically reviled, popularly dismissed, but nonetheless creatively substantial and meaningful current of cultural expression. You know, I, I think I'll be afraid to see myself, even on the screen. Oh, you'll get used to it, Larry. Just remember that an artist must have no fear. Why, a creation is almost a sacred thing. All creations. The good Lord created saints and he also created sinners. He created the lamb and the fawn, but he also created the wolf and the jackal. Now, oh, who can judge which is the most praiseworthy? For 25 years he's been the master. He created them all. And if I may say so in all due modesty, I regarded each one as a creation. No more important than this. Well, thanks for trying to cheer me up, but just the same. This scares me. Now remember, my boy, I created you so that you could scare others. As an actor, as an artist, that's your mission. Live up to it. Robert H. Harris plays Pete Dumond, the chief makeup artist for American International Studios. That's American International Studios, not American International Pictures, mind you. He's just finished escorting actor Gary Clark as actor Larry Drake as the teenage werewolf to the set of AIS's latest horror cheapy, Werewolf Meets Frankenstein, when two men from NBN Associates, an East Coast-based conglomerate that has recently bought out AIS, meet him in his studio. The audience, they tell him, is tired of beasts and boogeymen. What they want is pretty girls, comedy, and music. As a monster specialist, his services will no longer be necessary. So after Werewolf Meets Frankenstein wraps principal photography, he can kindly pack it in. Incensed by this shabby treatment after 25 years of passionate devotion to his craft, Demond is determined to take revenge on his superiors and, in poetic fashion, to use the teenage werewolf and teenage Frankenstein at his disposal to do it. Larry, this foundation cream has a new firming agent in it. Something that I perfected. So don't worry if you feel your skin tightening. Don't worry if it makes you it feel... It does feel kind of cool. Remember, my boy, it's in your best interests. Do exactly as I instruct you. You will play your scene well today. But after you've completed it, instead of coming back here, this is what I want you to do. As a thriller, How to Make a Monster isn't terribly effective, but as a work of gleeful, even pretentious self-reference, it is nonetheless replete with dramatic ironies that play on the select horror buff's awareness of film history. Extending from this, when considered in retrospect, it is also a subtly prescient film, one that more or less predicts a sea change at AIP as it adapted from the cinematic culture of the 1950s to the 1960s. For one, there's just the surface level of meta-humor. American International Studios is obviously a stand-in for American International Pictures, but presumably, and as evidenced by numerous AIP film posters visible in the backgrounds of some scenes, in the universe of How to Make a Monster, the entirety of AIP's back catalog still exists, and then some. I Was a Teenage Werewolf and I Was a Teenage Frankenstein certainly exist, as Dumond gets to have a nice little prophetic soliloquy in front of two giant posters for both films. Obviously, in-universe, he, not Philip Shear, is responsible for the creations themselves. 
Things get weird, though, when you start to tease out where the real teenage werewolf and Frankenstein end and where these unseen films within a film are supposed to begin. The casts of both films are very clearly visible on their respective posters, with Michael Landon as the teenage werewolf and Gary Conway as the teenage Frankenstein. In How to Make a Monster, as in real life, Landon did not return to reprise either his monster role or a fictionalized version of himself, and so we have the real newcomer Gary Clark as fictional newcomer Larry Drake. Opposite him, Gary Conway has returned to don the teenage Frankenstein garb, but he's playing an actor named Tony Mantell. Is Conway supposed to be playing his own replacement? Despite expectations, How to Make a Monster never actually features a single scene of teen werewolf and Frankenstein going toe-to-toe. Indeed, Clark and Conway share fairly little actual screen time together in or out of makeup. That is, before the full-color climax of the film, as the two are manipulated by DeMond back to his stereotypical gothic estate, where the far more insane than could be expected or was even minimally foreshadowed artist plans to, and this is not made explicit exactly, though there is a, it's rather inelegantly implied through some of the special effects. Basically, he plans to kill the two young stars and have them preserved as part of his collection of previous creations. The theatrical poster for How to Make a Monster declared, See, the ghastly ghouls in flaming color. But at no point are either Clark or Conway in costume during this climactic color sequence. The rest of the film, it's black and white, and that's the only time we see them in makeup is in black and white. Heck, DeBond also isn't seen in color, and even he at one point dons his own scarred caveman makeup in order to murder an ambitious studio security officer who's getting just a little too close to the truth. You know, even after decades of not being able to rely on the basic veracity of AIP's publicity, contemporary spectators must have been incensed and felt pretty cheated that they never got to see the werewolf and Frankenstein teens duke it out. But in a stunning bit of pure audacity, Cohen and Candle seem to self-referentially poke fun at exploitation false advertisement. There is precisely one scene in which Clark and Conway share the screen in makeup, and it's only seven minutes into the film as the actors are being prepared to shoot the climactic sequence of the film within a film, Werewolf Meets Frankenstein. Now, boys, listen carefully. Remember, this is the big scene of the picture. The audience is waiting for this, where, finally, Werewolf Meets Frankenstein. They hate each other. It's a fight to the death. It's the battle of the monsters, and it must be the high spot of the picture. It's got to be the greatest fight we've ever had on the screen. And I've got to get it in one take. Only rehearsing their scene, Clark and Conway rush in to grapple with one another. A split second after they meet, we cut right back to DeMond's studio. There's no fight. The entire scene lasts less than a minute. Well, hopefully they got it in one take. These more overt dramatic ironies and stabs at self-reference are undergirded by a much more subliminal artifice. As Bill Warren writes in Keep Watching the Skies, it presents a view of Hollywood as odd as anything ever depicted, lying between the Hollywood imagined by moviegoers and imagined by Hollywood itself. The real Hollywood just isn't shown in movies. Indeed, as far as Cohen and Candle's imagination, How to Make a Monster is a combination of tongue-in-cheek deception of the spectator and aspirational fantasy on the part of the filmmakers. The American International Studios of the film is a bona fide, if apparently minor, production outfit with an expansive studio lot, multiple productions occurring on site simultaneously, throngs of performers dressed as cowboys, scuba divers, and showgirls, and even its own studio tour. Hello, everyone. Our first stop will be on stage three, where they are now shooting Horrors of the Black Museum. Folks, I think you're in luck. The big scene of the picture shoots today. Now, if you will all stay together and follow me. 
just as an aside, Horrors of the Black Museum was actually another Herman Cohen production, although in reality it was shot in London, one of the first of many British-American co-productions between AIP and Anglo-amalgamated film distributors. Though American International Pictures itself had an office located near the Paramount studio lot, none of their films were ever shot there, nor did they possess their own studio space. Just as with Cohen's previous films, How to Make a Monster was actually shot on and around the Frederick W. Ziv company lot, which acted as a lease space for many indie film and TV productions. Like a hermit crab, AIP was effectively using the shell of another studio to present a far more ostentatious backdrop to their catalog of productions than was actually extant, a backstage artifice to complement the similarly deceptive publicity that sold their cheap output. And whereas AIP, founded as American Release Incorporation in 1954, had only been on the scene for three years, the fictionalized American International Studios is clearly supposed to have been around since the 30s at least. The illusions that tie the fictional AIS to the real-world AIP are largely ephemeral, such as the director of Werewolf Meets Frankenstein suggesting that DeMond can still find work on a foreign pickup, a direct reference to what would come to be AIP's increasing capitalization on either distributing or co-financing horror films imported from the United Kingdom, the profile of which were growing with the smash success of Hammer's full color return to gothic horror tradition with the Curse of Frankenstein in 1956. The director is largely speaking in terms of horror and sci-fi films booming in cycles, but by 1958, it was already becoming apparent that oversaturation was killing the market for cheapy black-and-white double features. Within two years, AIP would be forced to radically change their production strategy. Just like their major studio predecessors, it would become economically imperative to invest more money in less films as well as to expand into television and, most pertinently to How to Make a Monster, to diversify their output, expanding into precisely the kind of entertainments that the East Coast henchmen of the film want to see replace American International Studios' old hat monster rallies. Of course, as far as specifics, American International Pictures would remain a stalwart of independent filmmaking and distribution all the way up to 1979, when Arkoff would sell the company to Filmways Incorporated. American International Studios, on the other hand, in its implied history and structure, is much more akin to one of the little three major Hollywood studios, perhaps a Columbia, one of the few Poverty Row outfits to actually cross the threshold to majors' status, or better yet, Universal International Pictures, which had itself just recently been forced to lay off scores of contract technicians and artists, especially those specializing in the studios' B-Har and sci-fi divisions. In an interview with Tom Weaver published in 1994's Attack of the Monster Movie Makers, Cohen claims that the plot of the movie was explicitly inspired by the consolidation of the classical film studios as subsidiaries of larger, often East Coast-based conglomerates, and that perhaps remains one of the few truly fascinating things about the actual narrative of how to make a monster, as opposed to its ephemeral mixture of self-reference and aspirational fantasy. Despite DeMond clearly being a psychopath without a scrap of sympathetic integrity, no different from the predecessor mad scientists played by Whit Bissell and Louise Lewis, the East Coast bureaucrats, to an extent that can't simply be chalked up to their being programmatic horror movie casualties, they are afforded even less sympathy, and even get antipathy to a certain extent. Just as with Cohen's exploitation of teenage angst and crafting his formulas of the old exploiting and repressing the young, this tale of cold corporate logic leading to violent blowback, it never really finds a coherent purchase. In Cohen's previous films, the heroes were still invariably well-meaning adults who must restore the order abused by one lone psychopath, and in How to Make a Monster, DeMond's psychopathic behavior keeps escalating to an extent that it becomes 
impossible to interpret him as anything other than a jaded narcissist, rather than some kind of abused artist driven to the edge, as it was in the film's clear antecedent 1933's Mystery of the Wax Museum. Still, Demond's very monstrous character and the shallow, grandstanding effect that Harris gives his performance of the portentous dialogue, it signifies to us that he is effectively the mascot of Cohen's vision, a, a figure of neutral evil, whose value exists precisely in his ability to exercise our repressed disdain for order and control, our desire to lash out at established norms and conventions. When introduced to the merely lawful evil of the East Coast bureaucrats, Demond and we as spectators, we are gifted with a convenient, irredeemably cynical, archetypal target for those emotions. By accidental virtue of Cohen and Candle's largely utilitarian writing process, it is not so much that the sheer extent of Demand's psychopathology is slowly revealed over the course of the film, as it is that the confrontation with these self-satisfied little pod people from on high, it compels his own transformation into a more sadistic showman. And it's here that Cohen and Candle's pretensions can't help but inform their characterization of Demond to an extent that the reclusive human taxidermist psycho that Harris is playing by the end of the film is completely different from the, if overproud, artist of impassioned principles and devotion from the film's beginning. Monsters are finished. They're coming out of your ears. Saturation. A horror cycle is over. People want to hear music. They want to laugh. They want to see pretty girls. There's no doubt about it. Monsters are finny. I heard that 25 years ago when I created my first werewolf. It saved the studio from bankruptcy. Now look, I didn't come here to discuss this thing or to argue it with you. That is the decision of the big brass. It's mine too. Yes, but, well, it's a wrong one, if, if I may disagree. Why, even psychiatrists say that in all these monster pictures there's not only entertainment, but for some people, therapy. Well, you know we never get over our childhood fears of the sinister, the terrifying faces we see in nightmares. Well, through these pictures we can live out our hidden fears. It, it helps. You live them out, but not on our payroll. Demand's defense of film horror could very easily come straight from the mouth of James H. Nicholson himself. But although AIP would never truly retire from its B-film roots, whether in horror or otherwise, such impassioned defenses at this point in the company's history were the stuff of wishful thinking. The writing was already on the wall for the unceremonious end of the monster craze era. And as with Demand's dismissal in How to Make a Monster, this transition would come about only through the freezing out of precisely those unheralded artists whose passion was invaluable in establishing the company at all, and indeed rescuing it from the maw of its own cynical practices. What are these? My family. My children. During the color climax of How to Make a Monster, Demond reveals a votive collection of masks he has made throughout his career. While Philip Shear provided all of the primary makeup and monster effects for this film, as he had Teenage Werewolf, Frankenstein, and Blood of Dracula, all of the masks that we see on display in Demond's home are the products of Paul Blysdell, who my faithful listeners will remember from our very first episode, where we covered the Milner Brothers jungle horror classic From Hell It Came. Among Blysdell's creations on display, all of which would have been familiar to teen filmgoers and would continue to be iconic amongst monster movie fandom, these include Cuddles, the prehistoric humanoid past life of Marla English's protagonist from The She-Creature, a Mr. Hyde mask from Attack of the Puppet People, one of the cabbage-headed Martians from Invasion of the Saucermen, and Beulah, the enormous Venusian mushroom monster from It Conquered the World. 
There are also several original props created by Blaisdell specifically for the scene, designed to burn in the film's climactic finale, again directly hearkening back to the mystery of the Wax Museum to reveal human skulls beneath the latex and foam rubber. Bill Warren relates the following story about the shooting of the scene, as told by director Herbert Strock in several interviews. Effects man Charles Duncan was rehearsing the gas jets for the scene where Pete's place goes up in flames and things suddenly got out of hand. Although the fire department was standing by, Strock insisted the cameraman just start shooting what he could with one camera while Strock himself grabbed another. Warren visited Blaisdell in the late 60s, and according to him, the husk of Beulah the Venusian was hung over his fireplace. Upon inspection, it displayed signs of severe fire damage. None of Blaisdell's creations were ever terribly well preserved, but at least one was totally destroyed during the production of How to Make a Monster, the werecat mask that was used in a brief insert shot on 1957's Cat Girl. Quoting from Randy Palmer's biography on Blaisdell, That was bad enough in itself, but to add insult to injury, nobody photographed it while it was burning. Perhaps worst of all was the fact that the cat mask was never even in the film. It had been hung on a backdrop that faced away from the camera during the entire production. By this point in his career, Blaisdell was well acquainted with the casual, careless misuse of his creations, consistently produced at a cost and speed that any professional prop or effects man would have balked at. He was a man of uncommon devotion who found himself in persistent proximity to those who either weren't as competent or who would not listen to constructive criticism, or just didn't care in the end whether a particular shot and prop was ruined by an overzealous use of explosives, or a suit was abused while placed on a publicity tour for a film, or if he was forced to mutilate his own creations to be repurposed as a cost-saving effort. Blaisdell's foray into the film industry didn't last nearly as long as the fictional demand. And perhaps it goes without saying, his personality was completely different. Uh, nonetheless, How to Make a Monster is often considered eerily allegorical of Blaisdell's often thankless experience as AIP's chief monster man. Paul Blaisdell was born on July 21st, 1927 in Newport, Rhode Island, and grew up in Quincy, Massachusetts. From an early age, he developed a knack for design. He'd make his own kites, puppets, marionettes, and as he got older, he even graduated into designing and building model planes from scratch. He also loved the movies, as well as pulp horror and science fiction. After being discharged from the army in 1947, he took advantage of the GI Bill to enroll in the New England School of Art and Design. After graduation, he relocated with his wife Jackie to Topanga Canyon, California, where he would remain for the rest of his life. He enrolled in another school specializing in engineering and drafting design, eventually leading to his employment as a technical illustrator for the Douglas Aircraft Company. It was steady, if creatively unfulfilling work, but it gave Paul and Jackie the security and time to pursue their own artistic interests. For Paul, this became painting science fiction scenes, which he'd shop around to the country's various pulp magazines, which had exploded in popularity since the end of the Second World War. Finally, Paul sold a painting to Spaceway, a sci-fi magazine owned and edited by Bill Crawford of Fantasy Publishing Company. He would eventually be hired as its art editor, which put him in the sights of famed Forrest J. Ackerman, a magazine editor in his own right, as well as a literary agent and devout proponent of the burgeoning science fiction fan subculture. Indeed, Ackerman himself is often credited as coining the term science fiction. Sight unseen, he got Paul's contact from Crawford and offered to be the young artist's agent. Through this, Paul was able to submit art and receive commissions for the covers and pages of numerous genre publications, both nationally and internationally. 
the work was often demanding in terms of time constraints, as well as the absurd whims of certain editors and publishers, many of whom often didn't give a tinker's damn about the art itself or the rationale behind how or why an alien from this environment might look this way rather than that way, but it was a more steady and fulfilling outlet of Paul's creative potential than he had ever had in his entire life. Around the same time as Blysdell was entering the arena of professional pulp art, the fledgling AIP, then called the American Release Incorporation, was just getting off the ground as well, and Wyatt Ording, the writer-director of an extremely cheap indie feature, The Monster from the Ocean Floor, introduced Samuel Z. Arkoff and James H. Nicholson to the film's producer, the 28-year-old Roger Corman. Arkoff and Nicholson were interested in distributing the film, but were ultimately unwilling to budge on Corman's main stipulation, that he get money up front for the film, rather than having to wait on residuals from the film's inevitably prolonged regional release process. Corman ultimately sold the monster from the ocean floor outright to Lippert Pictures, and with that money was able to bankroll his next project, the racing-themed crime thriller The Fast and the Furious. No relation, if that's what you're thinking. Uh, this time, with Arkoff and Nicholson impressed by the upstart Corman's ambition, ARC agreed to distribute The Fast and the Furious as their premiere film, and cut a sweetheart deal that would compel them to collect the upfront money that Corman wanted from regional exhibitors desiring the show of the film. With this release, the iconic relationship between the eventual American International Pictures and its most prolific auteur was born. Corman immediately set to work developing numerous other projects, the next of which would be the westerns Five Guns West and Apache Woman. But Corman was also developing another science fiction monster flick, The Beast with a Million Eyes. When production hang-ups caused Five Guns West to go over schedule and over budget, Corman was forced to slash the budget of his monster film, or else have to pay out of pocket for any additional budget overruns. At that point, The Beast with a Million Eyes was just a title conjured up by James H. Nicholson, and ARC was already well underway crafting a publicity campaign well before a single page was written, complete with a poster displaying a snarling, catfish-like monster with several bulging eyes. Despite this, Corman began working with a screenwriter, Tom Filer, to craft a film in which the monster would have no physical form, thus saving them the cost of producing a prohibitively expensive costume, puppet, or props. When the finished film was screened for exhibitors, they were furious. It was bad enough that the film on its own was an interminable train wreck of the barest bones production quality, but now they had a far below standard product that they had already paid for that didn't even have the marquee draw that audiences would expect. And that was on the poster. Corman realized that he would need to do some last-minute reshoots in order to appease exhibitors with a product that wouldn't make him persona non grata in the film industry for good. So, Corman phoned up Forrest J. Ackerman and asked him to recommend him some talent who could turn in some quality product at the very last minute. At first, Ackerman recommended Ray Harryhausen, but of course Harryhausen's stop-motion process didn't come quickly or cheaply. Another name that Ackerman dropped was Jacques Fresco, but like any self-respecting professional, Fresco could only do the job for $1,000 at least. Corman was insistent. He was only willing to pay 200 bucks for the whole job. Ackerman cooked his brain over Corman's dilemma, partially just out of the morbid curiosity of seeing what sort of spectacular climax could be bought for just $200. It was then that he thought of Paul Blysdell. Blysdell had no professional experience making film monsters, sure, but... Ackerman knew that the prodigious young artist was fond of model building and puppetry, so shortly Blysdell was working away out of Corman's fix, although he was able to haggle the producer for another $200 for materials on top of the $200 for labor. Dream big, kids. 
In a very short amount of time, Blysdell cooked up an alien spaceship, a miniature airlock set for the film's climactic monster reveal, and a scale puppet monster about 18 inches high. From the outset, Blysdell took his sudden commission much more seriously than anybody with ARC demanded or expected. Having insisted on reading the film's script before agreeing to join the project, he decided that the monster he was designing, dubbed Little Hercules, would not actually be a representation of the unseen beast with a million eyes itself. Rather, it would be a mentally inferior slave who piloted the master's ship, and Blysdell outfitted Little Hercules with a pair of shackles on its wrist to imply the relationship between the two beings. By all accounts, Little Hercules was a remarkably dynamic puppet, if not a convincing one, but in what would turn out to be a foreshadowing of the rest of Blysdell's stint with the eventual AIP, he found fairly little appreciation of the DIY talents that Corman, Arkoff, and Nicholson so desperately required to achieve their vision. Not only did Corman not get the most out of the puppet's dynamic range of motion, but the producers also saw fit to superimpose a giant cyclopean eye over the sequence of the monster's reveal, further obscuring Blysdell's contributions. That said, it was the beginning of something special between the parties. Consistently able to work under incredible time and budgetary constraints, Blysdell's special brand of DIY monsters became iconic in their own right, and became an invaluable part of establishing the AIP look. Only a few weeks later, Blysdell got a call from Corman with another offer, to create the radioactive mutant monster for his post-apocalyptic action film, Day the World Ended. Blysdell would also perform the duty of donning the suit for that film, establishing a precedent for AIP to lean on him not only as their go-to monster's effects and prop man, but also their reliable monster performer. From 1955 through 1958, Blysdell, as well as his ever-present and often unacknowledged co-partner Jackie, would produce monsters, props, and performances for It Conquered the World, The She-Creature, Voodoo Woman, Not of This Earth, The Amazing Colossal Man, Attack of the Puppet People, Earth vs. the Spider, Cat Girl, Invasion of the Saucer Men, and Teenage Caveman. He also managed to find a rare bit of extracurricular work with the Edward Small and Robert E. Kent's It the Terror from Beyond Space, and made some minor contributions to Tom Graff's Teenagers from Outer Space in the form of the modified toy ray guns and the design of the film's one-sheet poster. Along the way, though, Blysdell also suffered his share of indignities, both emotional and physical. For one, when his mutant suit for Day the World Ended, affectionately named Marty, was taken on the road to regionally promote the film, it was returned in terrible condition. Apparently, precocious teenagers and kiddies were in the habit of tearing off bits and pieces of Marty as souvenirs, and Blysdell was incensed by the lack of due diligence the suit's escorts did in protecting it from vandalism. During the production of Voodoo Woman, he suffered an acid burn to his leg when he was misled as to the safety of some chemical smoke that was to be poured on him during a scene. There was also the time when producer Al Zimbalist effectively plagiarized his design for the giant wasps in Monster from Green Hell, as well as the occasional flagrant disrespect he experienced both on and off the set of It the Terror from Beyond Space. But perhaps worst of all was when he was commissioned specifically to refurbish a suit that he had already made, forcing him to mutilate his own creation to fit them into the premise for which they were never intended, as happened when Cuddles, of she-creature fame, easily Blysdell's most impressive and famous creation, was reused for first Voodoo Woman and eventually Ghost of Dragstrip Hollow. It's possible that the fiery climax of how to make a monster pretended the end of Blysdell's professional relationship with AIP, or that at the very least it made abundantly clear to him that nothing could be done with the company going forward without some drastic changes. But then again, how to make a monster was already prophetic and in denial. 
a subtle homage to the monster makers who saved Hollywood more than once from oblivion, it tells the story of a devoted, perhaps even overpassionate artist who is told that the shape of film to come has no room for cavemen, space aliens, and mutants. And by 1958, the returns for AIP's type of cheapy, quickie double features were significantly diminishing. Whether this was because fads were simply changing or because teenagers were just getting sick of false advertising is a moot point. The penny-pinching outfit would have to diversify, take stock of what types of films were now attracting teenage eyes, and make riskier investments in production of higher value. For a while, though, Arkoff, Nicholson, and Corman still coasted on whatever fumes they could juice out of the old jalopy, and to an extent that even the dependable Paul Blaisdell proved too expensive and self-respecting an artist. In 1959, Corman established his own independent production company, Film Group, which would allow him to make pictures to be sold outright to AIP or other interested distributors without their direct investment, and thus their creative control. The 60s would prove to be Corman's defining period as not just an exploitation of Huckster with above-average pretensions, but as a born-again auteur with a flair for pitch-black comedy and modernist aesthetics. He wasn't yet nor ever would be above the cheapy quickie of his formative years, but his output during this time, from his several Edgar Allan Poe films starring Vincent Price, especially The Mask of the Red Death, to X, The Man with the X-Ray Eyes, to Wild Angels, to The Trip, to the incendiary race drama The Intruder, these would not only prove to be the peak of his career, but to represent some of the finest pop art entertainment to emerge during the 60s, easily going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the emergent new Hollywood, which, not for nothing, would also be significantly affected by Corman's touch and influence as a producer, vetting the talents and facilitating the careers of no less than Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, Peter Bogdanovich, to mention only a few of them. But for Film Group to get off the ground, in some ways, Corman found himself taking a few steps back. When he wanted a cheap monster for a surreal horror heist film being handled by his brother Gene and directed by Monty Hellman of eventual two-lane blacktop fame, he, of course, went to Blaisdell. Blaisdell was just coming off of It the Tear from Beyond Space, which while a trying experience was also the highest paying and highest profile working with United Artists and the best critically received gig of his career. And here was Corman, again, now asking him to make a monster by standards even lower than Day the World Ended. He wouldn't do it, and so Corman turned to the project's costume man, Chris Robinson, who designed the film's monster out of chicken coop wire wrapped around a plywood base with putty and crepe hair pasted to the exterior for no extra money and just a special screen credit. Corman approached Blaisdell yet again for Attack of the Giant Leeches, but again, the fee was just too insultingly low. That was the end of Corman and Blaisdell's professional relationship. That wasn't quite the close of the book for his relationship with the AIP proper, though. Even as the company radically reoriented its production strategy, the intent was always to keep Blaisdell on as a reliable talent. His first project was to do concept art for the freshly minted producer George Worthing Yates' ambitious, Bradbury-esque, Mars-set space opera in the year 2889. The project never materialized, though since the title was already registered, Arkoff did eventually slap it onto an unrelated direct-to-TV pickup in 1969. In 1961, AIP released Master of the World, an ambitious adaptation of Jules Verne's Robur the Conqueror and Master of the World, written for the screen by Richard Matheson. Featuring Vincent Price as the captain of an advanced aerial warship, the surprise success of AIP's most ambitious film to date led to the proposal for a spin-off called Stratafin, which would see Price reprising his role alongside a new warship that could traverse land, air, and sea. Paul and Jackie were commissioned to do three-dimensional models of the submersible, though the job of sculpting it was mostly Jackie's. 
Again, the project fell through, although four years later, AIP did co-produce a Japanese science fiction film known internationally as Atragon with Toho Studios, which coincidentally turned out to feature another advanced warship that could both fly and submerge underwater. On the Italian pickup front, Nicholson commissioned Blaisdell to produce a concept painting for the first in a series of co-productions with an Italian studio to cash in on the current peplum cycle inspired by the smashing success of 1958's Hercules starring Steve Reeves, as well as the company's U.S. distribution of The Terror of the Barbarians, also starring Reeves. The project was to be called Goliath and the Dragon, which, once that initial project also fell through, became the English-language title of the unrelated Mark Forrest vehicle, The Revenge of Hercules, with a stop-motion action scene exclusive to the U.S. market stitched in. Blaisdell also submitted concept art for Jack the Giant Killer, but ultimately his designs lost out in favor of those by the more established industry players Marcel Delgado and Hua Chang. He was subsequently attached to two separate TV series that AIP was developing as part of their push into the television market, Out of This World and Beyond the Barriers of Space, both of which were aborted, but would have seen him effectively made head of an entire production department, guiding designs for costumes, props, and of course monsters from concept through execution. Though being less creatively involved, Blaisdell was, ironically, far better compensated for his work during this time than at any other point previous. Ultimately, however, as AIP moved farther and farther away from in-house monster movies, the commissions became fewer and fewer until they inevitably dried up. That wasn't to say they were no longer distributing films, but the company was increasingly content to outsource that element of their content, turning to those who would still work for the low fees that Paul no longer would. Instead, Blaisdell's final completed project with the company would turn out to be a teen exploitation comedy called Ghost of Dragstrip Hollow in 1959. In the film, Blaisdell plays a parody of himself a washed-up monster maker and actor, never one to vetch about his lot in life, always determined to do his best, Blaisdell's cinematic swan song saw the indignity he had weathered now being made the butt of a joke. I knew I'd seen you before. Of course you've seen me before. I scared you to death, to death the day the world ended. You shivered when you saw me in the sea creature. Phony! I knew it was a phony! The shame of it. The indignity. They didn't use me in horrors of the Black Museum. After my years of faithful service, they just discarded me. Eventually, Paul's opinion of AIP completely soured. In later years, he would say he was less upset about the not getting work as he was what it said about how little he was appreciated after all those years. Quote, But to be perfectly honest, I was beginning to get a little tired of the whole game. AIP had made a lot of promises over the years, and I think they forgot most of what they said almost as soon as they said it. Blaisdell's longtime friend, informal archivist and film historian Bob Burns, had this to say. In the early years, AIP kept telling Paul, you're part of the AIP family. You'll grow as the company grows, and by this time next year, you'll be earning twice as much money. Sam was always saying things like that, but his sentiments sure didn't last very long. Paul got upset because they never increased his salary or gave him a bonus. It wasn't Jim Nicholson's fault. If anything, it was because Arkoff was always so very businesslike. He didn't leave room for personal feelings or well wishes or that sort of thing. Sam controlled the purse string, and if that meant hiring cheaper monster makers, then so be it. <laughs> You know, another reason I want to keep a souvenir of this picture is that I enjoy working with these teenagers. They've got spirit and they cooperate. They don't sour on you like some of the older actors. Oh, but these teenagers, they've got spirit and confidence. They plunge into a role. They put themselves in your hands. Though never particularly adroit, Herman Cohen's romanticizing of youth was never far from the letter of his films. In that interview with Tom Weaver, he says... I have always felt that most teenagers think that adults, their parents or their teachers, anyone that was older and that had authority, were the culprits in their lives. 
I know I felt that way when I was a teenager, and in talking to many teenagers, I found out that that was how they felt. And even today, it hasn't changed, you know. And so, in doing pictures primarily for the teenage audience, I thought that this theme would strike them just right. This romanticism with regards to youth transcended Cohen's oeuvre. For a while, it was definitive of the entire AIP ethos, and is exemplified in the pairing of How to Make a Monster with the second half of the double bill, Roger Corman's Teenage Caveman. The god that gives death with a touch is there. Have you seen... Has anyone of the clan seen it? The gray beard tells of the god. Long ago, when he could reach no higher than my knee, are we to be made afraid by an old one's baby dream? The law is old, but age is not always truth. Easily one of the most bizarre entries of the teen exploitation cycle, Teenage Caveman follows Robert Vaughn as the titular Teenage Caveman, who grows weary and impatient with the stifling, archaic laws of his society, seeking to venture into forbidden places and break taboos in a veritably Nietzschean drive to lead his people out of the primitive age. About as blatant an allegory as any for idealistic baby boomers seeking to rebuff the complacency and conservatism of their parents' generation, it typifies the AIP imaginary of youth subculture and its virtuous promise to the same extent that How to Make a Monster typifies the imaginary of commercial filmmaking. Part of it is calculated deception, and part of it is earnest aspirational fantasy. Obviously, it's hard to tell where one thread ends and the other picks up, where the motivations of this filmmaker's uh, to capitalize on the impulsivity and puerility of an empirically reliable juvenile audience turn to authentic identification with this generation, representing some full-throated, hot-blooded, something that's innocent. Indeed, as a young company itself, part of AIP's ingenuity in capturing the teen market no doubt had something to do with the unique mindset of certain key figures and contributors, particularly Nicholson, Cohen, and Corman. For as much as they recognized the economic imperative over the artistic one, they nonetheless consistently demonstrated themselves to be lovers of film, marginalized genres, and filmmaking in their own right. And just as much as the success of the company depended upon the allowances of teenagers, so it did depend on the uncommon drive and often irrational dedication of young talent, as Randy Palmer astutely notes in his biography of Paul Blaisdell. Whereas most authors have emphasized AIP's exploitation of audiences, Palmer emphasizes their exploitation of talent. And AIP did make money. In time, they made lots of it. The way they did that was by hiring young people, many new to the industry, who had little or no professional motion picture experience, but possessed a seemingly inexhaustible supply of energy and dedication to making the most entertaining and respectable products possible under trying, sometimes difficult, and occasionally nearly impossible circumstances. Even at its most cynical, the exploitation cinema of the 50s almost invariably found the obverse of that instinct in earnest pretension, that the filmmakers were not just pandering to, but also tapping into and speaking from the collective unconscious of a particular zeitgeist. Inevitably, though, the films serve more as an ideological fantasy for their certified adult creators than for their prospective juvenile audiences. To wit, the story of Paul Blaisdell undermines any sense of romantic innocence. Throughout Teenage Caveman, 
one of the primary taboos that keeps this primitive society sequestered to their small, natural sphere is the myth of the god that gives death with a touch, a thoroughly bizarre and final original monster created by Blysdell, although it would be reused again in Night of the Blood Beast. And there's also some stock footage of uh, Marty from Day the World Ended and... uh bubbles from the she-creature used at the end of this film, but more on that twist coming up. By the conclusion of the film, the creature is revealed to be an ageless scientist in a contamination suit that has become overgrown with algae and plant life. The twist ending of the story is that it actually takes place in Earth's post-apocalyptic future, mankind having returned to a primitive state after thermonuclear war has totally obliterated civilization. With Vaughn as the confident new leader of this tribe, the promise is made that mankind may one day rise again from the ashes, but whatever one may say about the twist, it distills the formulaic rut into which the adults at AIP had ground themselves. As far as Blysdell was concerned, in retrospect, the only reason that the company was able to right the ship as returns diminished was because Nicholson remained committed to inquiring as to what teen moviegoers might actually want to see, not his imagining of what they wanted. Jim had teenage children of his own, and he liked to get together with them and pal around with them and talk to them about movies because Jim was a movie buff himself. He would always ask them what they would most want to see in movies, and he really listened to them. He did not go on down the same old tired line, making detective movies that would bore you to death and stuff like that. Nick was very astute and very responsive to what the kids wanted to see, and he acted accordingly. Now then, when it came time for a change, which happened around 1960 or 61 for AIP, that was because Jim was still listening to his kids. They were still telling him what they wanted to see but their tastes were changing, as was most of society's at the time. I really think we all were getting fed up with the Cold War type of movie and thinking about building bomb shelters in the backyard and wondering how soon the world was going to come to an end. And I honestly believe that's one reason why AIP began making different kinds of pictures. The Poe movies, for example, were so gothic and so far removed from the average person's experiences they were more fantasies than horrors. So it was all right to move in that direction because the audience didn't have to think about what was going on in the Soviet Union or China or even in the US. The How to Make a Monster Teenage Caveman Double Bill is like the signpost of the end of AIP's first teen-centric era. It was not just that the Atom Age antics would need to be retired in favor of a more classical, gothic, less socially conscious, even reactionary turn. Even looking at Demond's cherishing of his young actors and the fearlessness they represent, it also represents the beginning of the end as far as the romantic imaginary of youth as being defined by the imaginary of youth itself. Just as parochial concerns overshadowed the elite hysteria of the bomb, so too did real-life juvenility overshadow the pandering courtship of exploitation gurus. AIP was always, rather, the cannibal of youth itself, which ends up being literalized not only in Demand's unceremonious prophetic dismissal from the diversifying American International Studios, but also in that character's attempt to effectively live on, cynically, through his teenage children. Just think, in the years to come, you'll both be up there, a refuge, a permanent home. Now look, Pete, we're thankful to you and all that, and, well, we know it's an honor, well, but to level with you, we don't feel quite right in here. We'd like to get out. To tell you the truth, we tried. But you locked the door. Yeah, so just let us out. Is that how you repay me? After all my big plans for you, are you two trying to break away from me, from my influence? Now, don't try to confuse us anymore. We don't want you or your influence. Now, just open the door. You're crazy, Pete. Not crazy enough to let you escape. <laughs> 